Hey, good morning, Four Winds family. It's Pastor Joel here. So glad that you're able to tune in to our online service. You know, whether you're watching this live, whether you're watching this on our YouTube channel, maybe you're watching this, it's not live. Uh, just my, my goal in all of these videos is really that you would get to experience the Word of God, the presence of God, that you be equipped to be the person that God's always intended for us to be able to be. And uh, that's what he sent Jesus for, is, is uh, uh, that we might be adopted into God's family. What does that mean and what does that look like? Well, let's explore the Word of God together and let's find out. Now, if you got a Bible with you, I want you to turn to Acts chapter, let's pick it up in Acts chapter 24. We'll, we'll read the last uh, verse of Acts 24 and then we'll get into our main passage today. But I just want you to have that ready. We're going to open up with a word of prayer. I'd also like to mention that if you want the notes for these messages, I'm going to try to remember to put the link into the description here on the YouTube channel and you can uh, download those notes. You can print them out. It's something that's useful, uh, I think, you know, to uh, be able to have as a just a quick reference. It's just a short summary of a lot of the ground that we're going to cover today. And uh, at the end, there's also some good discussion points. We used to like to, uh, when, when Jonah was living with us, we'd, we would have uh, those discussions around the table and, uh, and talk about what we just heard, what we just watched, and what does that mean, and how does that look for our lives. All right, well, let's open with a word of prayer. And let's see what God is going to say to us today. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I, I just ask that you would cause your word to open up. Lord, we open our hearts to you. We open our hearts to truth. We open our hearts to your spirit to work within us. Lord, I pray that you cause your word to may, be accessible to us. Lord, as we explore it, I, I ask that you cause it to come alive within us. Help us to see the things that you want us to respond to, how it applies to our life and how we might take another step in the direction that you've always wanted us to be able to walk in. Lord, we pray that you would equip us by your word today, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Well, let's get into this. we got a lot of ground I want to cover today. This is message number 31. We're going to call this one, The Witness in Judea, Part 2. Not really an imaginative title, but uh, it's you'll understand why as we get into this. You know, Paul's multi-year ordeal is what the book of Acts kind of zooms in and focuses on in the final eight chapters. From chapter 21 to 28, you have this whole episode that Paul goes through. And in this multi-year ordeal, I found that it reenacts Jesus' three-phase program of expansion that the book of Acts opens up with. It's interesting. Two books of the Bible open up with Jesus giving us an outline of the book. Revelation is one of those. If you check it, chapter 1 very carefully, you'll see an outline to the entire book. Also, you see that in the book of Acts. He says, the Holy Spirit's going to come and empower your life. You're going to become a witness to me, both in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, furthest reaches of the earth. And so I want us to look at that again, but this time I want our perspective to be focused on the Holy Spirit's empowerment. What does it mean to be empowered to be a witness? What is that, you know, what, what form does that take? You know, sometimes we have it in our heads because we went to a meeting or, or we were at a revival or something. We saw some pretty wild stuff. You know, we saw God healing people. Maybe we, maybe we saw some other miracles take place. Maybe we saw somebody pray for somebody and they shook under the power of God or, or they manifested the Holy Spirit in some way that we've never seen before. We thought uh, that's, that's what it must be to be a powerful man or woman of God. Well, if we look at the book of Acts carefully, I think what we're going to discover is that the book of Acts shows being empowered to be a witness unto Jesus by the Holy Spirit can take on many different forms. Sometimes we see mass conversions, thousands of people believing in Jesus and responding to the gospel at one time. But we also see him dealing with people on a one-on-one -on -one level. We see deliverances take place. We see healings take place. But we also see in these final eight chapters here, we also see what it means to be empowered to be a witness when you're going through really tough and unfair times. So I want us to, to, to look at that through that lens. Let's remember, what we're seeing here is Paul empowered by the Spirit to be a witness of Jesus. So this, this, this eight year, uh, chapter period, it actually reenacts 
the three-phase program of expansion from Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We see Paul's witness in Jerusalem, literally in chapters 21 to 23. He's actually in Jerusalem and, and being a witness, and some really tough stuff's happening to him there. We see in chapters 24 to 26, his witness in Judea, and that's what we're going to actually finish up today. So we got up through chapter 24 last week. We kind of straddled those two sections by looking at chapters 23 and 24 last time. We're going to look at 25 and 26 today. And then finally, his witness to the furthest reaches of the earth in chapters 27 and 28. And that'll bring the book of Acts to a conclusion. If we want to outline Acts chapters 25 and 26, we can organize it in three parts. All, the, all three parts start with the letter A. And so we see Paul's appeal. He's got one last card to play. He's been holding on to this card. Right? Life's dealt him a really rough hand here. And the Holy Spirit's prepared him for it, told him in advance, you're going to go through this really tough season. He's holding one last card. He uses it in uh, chapter 25, verses 1 to 12. His third hearing takes place. So we're going to see him appeal to the Caesar. We're going to see the governor's dilemma in, in uh, verses 13 to 27. That'll complete Acts 25. He has to have some allegations to send Paul to the emperor with. And so he's he's got a dilemma. We'll look at that in just a moment. And then we're going to try to spend most of our time on the articulation. In chapter 26, we find Paul's final testimony in Judea. It's also the second time he gives his own personal perspective on the events that we saw back in Acts chapter 9. So let's back up to Acts 24 and look at the very last verse to get the context. Again, it's a tough section to, to find stopping points in because from chapter 21 onward, it's just a continuous flowing narrative. Acts 24, verse 27. But after two years had passed, Paul's been in house arrest for two years, and the corrupt governor, Felix, was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and wishing to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. We talked about that last time. But that leads to the transfer now between the two governors, and that's what we're going to run into in Paul's third hearing. This is where he makes his appeal. Chapter 25, verse 1. Festus then, having arrived in the province three days later, went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. So he arrives at Caesarea, which is the capital of the province, but Jerusalem's where all the Israeli religious and civil authorities are. And so he needs to meet with these people. He needs to have a good relationship with them if he's going to be a successful governor in this province. It says, And the chief priests and the leading men of the Jews brought charges against Paul. They use this occasion to renew their attacks on Paul, and they were urging him, requesting a concession against Paul that he might have him brought to Jerusalem. At the same time, they were seeking to set an ambush against him to kill him on the way. And so this is a, kind of a renewal of what we saw back in Acts 23. Festus then answered that Paul was being kept in custody at Caesarea, and that he himself was about to leave and go back to Caesarea shortly. Therefore, he said, let the influential men among you go there with me. And if there's anything wrong about the man, let them prosecute him. In other words, he wants to have the trial in Caesarea where he's in control. You know, he's new to the province, maybe a little insecure, and he feels more comfortable doing this in Caesarea where the prisoner already is. So Festus has arrived in the province. We know from history that he was appointed by Caesar Nero probably in 59 or 60 AD. Let's call it 60 AD, kind of rounded off to a round number there uh, when he uh, finally takes his appointment in Judea. So about 30 years now have passed from Acts chapter 1. That might be a little surprising how much time has elapsed from Acts chapter 1. Because if you just casually read the book, it seems like, you know, it, it happens bing, 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 and we don't realize there's substantial passages of time in between certain episodes in the book of Acts. Upon visiting Jerusalem to meet the Israeli religious authorities, the governor is met with a request that does concern Paul. They want the governor to transfer custody of Paul back over to them because they see this as a religious and not a civil matter. And so it's within their purview, they believe, to prosecute him. The difficulty, though, that this is going to pose for everybody, and it has been from the beginning, is that Paul is a Roman citizen, and that gives him certain rights that complicates matters. 
Verse 6, after Festus had spent no more than eight or ten days among them, in Jerusalem that is, he went down to Caesarea, and on the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. After Paul had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him, which they could not prove. While Paul said in his own defense, I have committed no offense either against the law of the Jews or against the temple or against Caesar. I'm an innocent person. And everybody knows this. So once more, unprovable. They're serious charges, but they're unprovable charges are brought against Paul. Now, I imagine this is getting pretty tiresome. You know, if you were Paul, you know, you'd be pretty weary of this. This has gone on now for two years, and we keep coming back and doing this over and arriving at the same result. For two years, he's been held captive based on false and unprovable charges. Life has been very unfair to Paul during this season. And I think there's an important lesson there in this for us. While we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to live as a witness unto Jesus, we are still going to experience in our lives unfair treatment. That's something we need to mentally at least be prepared for. It's not a question of will we, but when are we going to encounter things that are just plain unfair? And those those, those seasons of unfair treatment are opportunities to be a witness empowered by the Spirit of God. So if we look at it through that lens, I am getting an opportunity to be a witness of Jesus. I'm empowered by Holy Spirit through this unfair treatment. I think we can navigate it in a much more healthy manner. How are we going to choose to handle that treatment? Are we going to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit? We are empowered. If you are a believer in Jesus, you've given your life over to Him. You transferred custody of your will your decision-making capacity over to Christ's care and control, guess what? You are empowered by the Holy Spirit. So, are you going to handle unfair treatment on your own, or are you going to handle it in the power of the Holy Spirit? It's our choice. Jesus said our witness would be empowered by the Holy Spirit, and so I'm going to choose to go through that. My seasons of unfair treatment, I want to go through it not in my own human inability, but I want to go through it empowered by God's Holy Spirit. Verse 9. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, there we go again, (laughs) he needs favor with these provincial people if he's going to be a successful governor. At the same time, he, as a Roman governor, needs to protect a Roman citizen. It's it's an incompatible assignment. He's put in an, an impossible position. If you're Festus, this is an impossible situation. How are you going to do this? Because he needs to placate the Israeli authorities if he's going to avoid having them turn against him and there be a revolt against Rome. That's the worst case scenario. He's trying to avoid that. But at the same time, he's uh, he's obliged by law and by oaths to protect Roman citizens. And so he's trying to figure out a way to navigate this. And so he wishes to do the Jews a favor. And he answered Paul and he said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me on these charges? That would be a favor to them. But Paul said, I'm standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. I've done no wrong to the Jews, as you very also very well know. If then I'm a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. But if none of these things is true, of which these men accuse me, no one can hand me over to them. And then he pulls out his trump card. This is his last card to play in the game. The deck's been stacked against him. And so he's put in this position where he feels like now is the time to play this card. He says, I appeal to Caesar. Verse 12. Then when Festus had conferred with his counsel, he answered, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you shall go. So Paul makes his appeal here. You know, Festus seems to be stalling for time again trying to figure out how to navigate this impossible task. He figures, if I send Paul to Jerusalem, that will be a favor to the Israelis. They will know I've done everything I can to make things fair for them, but I will oversee the trial and I will protect Rome. And so he thinks that in doing this, he's going to conciliate both parties here. Paul's unwilling to be taken advantage of any further here. He realizes that you know, I've done nothing wrong. The governor knows that I've done nothing wrong here. I'm standing trial where I ought to stand trial. If you're unwilling to see the facts as they've now been laid out, 
the situation is not going to be improved by a transfer of location. So, you know, removing me from here to there, it's not going to change the situation at all. If the governor cannot or will not see Paul's innocence in Caesarea, he's not going to see it in Rome, in other words. And any transfer to Jerusalem, it's going to be fatal to him. He knows that the game's up there. If the governor gives in to the religious authorities in this instance, what's to keep him from give, you know, going one more step? It would be easier for him to hand over a Roman citizen when the, where the Romans aren't watching as closely in Jerusalem than for that to happen at Caesarea. And so Paul makes his decision. He's going to uh, uh, appeal to the emperor. He invokes his right that every Roman citizen had to appeal to the emperor for final adjudication of his case. And so he has to find out what allegations to label Paul with when he sends him to the emperor. Verse 13, now when several days had elapsed, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and paid their respects to Festus. Now, King Agrippa is known outside the Bible as King Herod Agrippa II. In fact, he's actually the son of Herod the king from Acts chapter 12, the one who put James or Jacob, the, the apostle, the brother of, of John, he put him to death with the sword. He tried to have Peter executed as well. There's that supernatural jailbreak that takes place. That was this guy's father. So that's, that kind of gives you a sense of the family tree here. If memory serves, I think he was the great-grandson of Herod the Great. It's a really complicated family tree, though, so I could be uh, uh, mistaken in that. He is also a distant relative. I think the Herod before which Jesus stood trial uh, in, in Jerusalem, he briefly was sent over to Herod. Remember when Jesus was uh, about to be crucified? Pontius Pilate sent him to Herod. That was Herod Antipas, and that, I believe, is this guy's either uncle or great uncle. I don't recall exactly which. Again, very complicated family tree. His jurisdiction borders that of the new governor of Judea. So you see on the map here, you'll see that uh, the, the green section, that's the jurisdiction of the governor, Governor Festus. The yellow and light green sections and the red section way up north, that is the, uh, the domain, the jurisdiction of King Herod Agrippa. His, his uh, his realm is kind of truncated and sometimes separated by uh, places where he doesn't have jurisdiction. It's kind of a strange arrangement that Rome has created for him. So this is a courtesy visit. Bernice is, because it says King Agrippa and Bernice arrive, and Luke talks about him like we should know who these people are. Well, back then, these guys were celebrities. Uh, Bernice is King Agrippa's sister. It's not his wife. It's his sister. Now, there's all kinds of rumors about them having a relationship. Uh, it was very sordid rumors, but nothing was ever proven about this. But uh, she was with her brother on this occasion. Bernice almost becomes an empress. She becomes the mistress of uh, General Titus and also possibly Vespasian. So two different people who become emperors, she was involved uh, at least romantically with for a season. So these were celebrities at this time. Verse 14, while they were spending many days there, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, there is a man who is left as a prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it is not the custom of the Romans to hand over any man before the accused meets his accusers face to face and has an opportunity to make his defense against the charges. So after they had assembled here, I did not delay, but on the next day I took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought before me. When the accusers stood up, they began to bring charges. They began bringing charges against him, not of such crimes as I was expecting, but they simply had some points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss as to how to investigate such matters, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there stand trial on these matters. But when Paul appealed to be held in custody for the emperor's decision, I ordered him to be kept in custody until I send him to Caesar. So here now is the problem. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Now pay attention that that might be important in just a moment. 
he, he's interested. I want to hear what this guy has to say. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So Festus lays Paul's case before the king. Now, Festus ended up trading one problem for a new problem. His initial problem was how to give Paul a fair trial and not anger the Israeli authorities with whom he needs to have a good working relationship. And so he solves that. That, that problem has been solved when Paul appeals to the emperor. But now his new problem is, how do I send him to the emperor? I need to send some charges against him. And so under what charges should Paul be sent to Rome? What allegations, in other words? To solve this problem, he seeks the counsel of an expert. King Agrippa is recognized to be an expert in this particular field. This is also going to lead to Paul being given an opportunity for one final witness, one final testimony of Jesus in Judea before he is transferred uh, to Rome. Now, Paul's appearance before King Agrippa, it, it forms another interesting parallel between Paul and Jesus. We've explored this a couple times now in the last two messages. There's several occasions where Paul's going to go through something that's very similar to what Jesus goes through in Jerusalem before his crucifixion. Jesus, you'll recall, was handed over to the governor Pontius Pilate. Pilate hands Jesus over to King Herod briefly because Herod had jurisdiction over Galilee. Pilate finds out Jesus is a Galilean. He says, hey, I can get out of this. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass the buck over to this guy. And so King Herod Antipas is allowed to you know, try Jesus. And, and so Jesus has a brief hearing in front of King Herod Antipas. Not much of a hearing because Jesus wouldn't speak. He wouldn't answer any questions. And so Pilate hands him over to King Herod Antipas briefly. And then Herod, frustrated that he can't really get any answers and doesn't really see what the problem is, he kind of gets frustrated with it and hands it back over to Pilate. Says, well, this is, this is really your problem. This is your matter. He's being accused here in Jerusalem. So Jesus actually has the same number of trials in a sense that Paul has here. So just like Jesus, Paul has three trials, and they form parallels with one another. When, when Paul has his trial before Felix and Drusilla in Acts 24, it seems to correspond to Jesus' trial in its first phase before Pilate. And if you look at Matthew's gospel, Pilate's wife gets involved in some capacity. Just like there's Drusilla and Felix, there's Pilate and Pilate's wife. Then he, when, when Herod Antipas sends Jesus back over to Pilate for the second phase in his trial before Pilate, uh, Paul has this trial before Festus here in Acts 25, and it seems to correspond to Pilate being sent back over to Herod. And it's in this phase of the trial that Pilate washes his hands. He says, I'm done with this. He washes his hands of the matter and allows Jesus to be crucified. And so in a very similar way, Paul appeals to the Caesar, and Festus kind of washes his hands of the matter. He says, to Caesar you shall go. You've appealed to him, to him you shall go. So there seems to be another parallel there. Well, now we see that Paul's going to have this hearing in front of King Herod Agrippa II, and that seems to correspond with Jesus' trial before King Herod Antipas who we recall from Luke's gospel, Luke 23, verse 8, says that Herod wanted to see Jesus for a long time. He saw Jesus as you know someone that did magic tricks, and he just wanted to be entertained by him. And so he had really wanted to see this guy. And so he was excited to have that opportunity. In a similar way, we saw just a moment ago that Herod Agrippa II, King Agrippa, was really excited to get an opportunity to hear Paul's views about Messiah. So kind of an interesting uh, uh, sequence of parallels here. Verse 23, So on the next day, when Agrippa came together with Bernice amid great pomp and entered the auditorium accompanied by the commanders and the prominent men of the city at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. So a lot of pomp and ceremony here. Festus said, King Agrippa and all you gentlemen here present with us, you see this man about whom all the people of the Jews appealed to me both at Jerusalem and here loudly declaring that he ought not live any longer. But I found he had committed nothing worthy of death, which begs the question, why are we even here, right? Cut him loose. And since he, appealed, he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. 
So there's, there's something more going on here than an admission that he knows that Paul is innocent of wrongdoing here. Uh, it, it's an admission that he's, uh, you know, being, he's having to endure some unfair treatment and we're perpetuating that unfair treatment by even having him here today. And so it's, it's kind of interesting. It's an admission that they've, they're, they're really mistreating this guy. If Felix knows that Paul's not guilty, then he's got to make the, the moral decision to cut him loose, even if that means losing popularity with the people that you're trying to court favor with. And so Paul remains a prisoner here, even though he's done nothing worthy of imprisonment or death. But when Paul speaks, I, I want to highlight this for a moment here because we're just going to get into to Paul's testimony in just a second here. But when Paul speaks, I want you to notice the tone that he uses. I want you to notice how he speaks. He doesn't speak like a victim. He doesn't talk like someone whose rights are being violated. He doesn't talk like, like you would expect a victim to speak. In fact, what you see is you see someone speaking as though he is empowered by the Holy Spirit to be a witness. And I don't know if maybe he recognized it at the time that his life was mirroring what Jesus went through. What an honor it was for Paul to go through many of the same exact things that Jesus had gone through. That's an incredible honor. Maybe he recognized it. Maybe he didn't see it in that moment. I'm sure he sees it now. But I want you to notice that when he speaks, Paul speaks as someone who is empowered by the Spirit of God. Verse 26, the governor continues, Yet I have nothing definite to write about him to my Lord, the emperor. Therefore I brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that you, so that after the investigation has taken place, I may have something to write. He's like, I need advice as to what allegations to send Paul to Rome with. For it seems absurd to me in sending a prisoner not to indicate also the charges against him. <laughs> he appealed to the Caesar. What's he's done wrong? I don't know how to explain it. That's the problem the governor is dealing with. And so he's seeking to draw from King Agrippa's expertise. Now here's where we encounter something I think important to the content of chapter 26. King Agrippa was recognized as something of an authority on Jewish religion and culture. He is at least ethnically part Jewish, but he's really embraced that part of his ethnic background. Okay, he's he's from the Herodian family, which you know had Edomite blood. They were Idumeans or Edomites, but they also had they married into Israeli families, and so they had both Israeli and Edomite blood. And so, he, but he's really embraced the Israeli side of that mixed heritage. And so here in chapter 26, we're going to see Paul's final testimony. In his own words, his own personal testimony, and he's going to articulate the essentials of the message that his life carries. And I think it's really important that we spend the last of our time today really looking at this section. Verse 1, Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Now, this isn't a trial per se. This is an interview. This is an opportunity. Maybe Paul's been in prison for two years unfairly so that he can speak openly and freely to some very important personages. We don't know all the names of the people in this room, but he's going to have an impact here. He's given the opportunity to do something that none of the other apostles have been given an opportunity to do. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, by the Israeli religious authorities, I consider myself fortunate. Man, I would circle that, highlight that, mark that in a distinct way. I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I'm about to make my defense before you today. In other words, everything I've gone through is worth it because I get to do this. That's his attitude here. That's what the Holy Spirit's empowerment can do in our life. He says, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Now, Paul doesn't lay it on thick. He doesn't, he's not buttering this guy up. Remember before Felix, the, the lawyer from Jerusalem just butters him up, says all kinds of things that sound really nice, but the, none of them are true. And Paul wouldn't do that. He speaks courteously, but he doesn't lie. 
and and uh, and just kind of well to use a blunt term, he doesn't brown nose him. Here, Paul, when he says you're an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews, Paul speaking honestly here. Agrippa really did know his material. And so Paul says, this is, this is a great opportunity. I'm really excited to talk to you because you know the content that I want to talk about. Therefore, he says, I beg you to listen to me patiently. And I think that we, what he says, that that's a signal for us as the reader to really pay attention to the content of his testimony here. It would be tempting to read it and say, yeah, 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 I've seen this before. We saw it in Acts 9. I saw it in Acts 22. Yeah, I got it. You, you fell off your horse, bright light. Jesus called you. Got it. Move on to the next chapter. Let's get to the shipwreck, right? And just move through the book. But hold on. There's some content here. There's some subtle differences. There's some, some things that he highlights here that weren't highlighted in those other passages that we want to be sensitive to. While you and I might be tempted to bemoan our unfortunate, disadvantageous circumstances, Paul finds an advantage here. We might find this situation to be really unfair and disadvantageous to us, but he finds an advantage here. Paul's going to be given an opportunity to address a man who's recognized to be an expert in this particular field. Now, so are the high priests, so are the chief priests and the members of the Sanhedrin, but there's one crucial difference. King Agrippa, while he's an expert in this, this subject matter here, he's also not someone who's emotionally compromised. He's not, he doesn't come into this room already biased against Paul. He's already coming in with an open mind. He wants to hear what this guy's perspectives are. He's curious. Verse 4, So then all Jews know my manner of life from my youth on up. He's using hyperbole here. He says, if you've been around Israelis, they, they, everyone around here should know my upbringing because I, I grew up in Jerusalem. He says, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem, since they have known about me for a long time, if they're willing to testify, you can ask around. In other words, he says, if people are willing to testify openly and say, yeah, I know this guy when he was a kid. I knew him when he was a young man. He says that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. This is my background. This is my upbringing. And now I'm standing trial. He says, I was brought up very conservative in terms of my spiritual life. It's the strictest sect of our faith. I've not compromised that is what he's trying to get across. He says, now I'm standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. The promise to which the, our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day for this hope. O king, I'm being accused by the Jews. He's trying to show the irony in his situation. He hasn't compromised his upbringing. He's merely advanced to where that upbringing had pointed him. Why is it considered incredible? Apistis in the uh, in the Greek, ah, the prefix a or ah, it's it's a strong negative. Pistis is to believe. It's the word the Greek word for faith. Why is it considered impossible to believe that God does raise the dead? So we're going to find here a strong emphasis is on the resurrection in this testimony. When he says, I'm standing trial for the hope of the promise made to our fathers, he's talking about our forefathers, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in particular. You can read about them in the second half of the book of Genesis. Now, God makes a lot of commitments to their ancestors, and some of those commitments he has yet to bring to pass. He's brought many of them to pass, but not all of them. So it's really important for us as believers today to pay attention to those promises because God's still going to fulfill all of it. God made promises to the ancestors of the Israeli nation, and he gave them hope. Now, it's not explicit, but it's implicit in those promises that it includes resurrection from the dead. Because when the promise made to Abraham is passed on to Isaac, God says, I'm the God of your father, Abraham. When it's passed on to Jacob, God says to Jacob, I'm the God of your father, Isaac, and Abraham. So every time it gets passed down, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And Jesus points this out. I think it's in Matthew 22. He points this out to the Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection, he says, you don't understand. God said, I am 
the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's implied, the resurrection is implied in that statement. He's not the God of the dead, he's God of the living. And so he gave their ancestors hope, and by faith, Paul is saying, I've taken hold of that hope. Central to that hope is the resurrection of the dead. God does raise the dead. This is the cornerstone of Paul's message, not just in the book of Acts, but throughout all of his writings. I'd like for you to pay attention to how often he speaks of the resurrection. Belief in the resurrection was a core tenet of the Pharisees. So Paul has not departed from his upbringing. Rather, he's advanced to the place the very place his upbringing had been pointing him. He said, my upbringing pointed me to believe in this. I have reached out and I've taken hold of this. This is real. There is a resurrection of the dead. And Jesus is is the first in in that resurrection. He's the first to rise from the dead. Everyone else that rises from the dead in him will take part of the life that's in him. Verse 9, so then I thought to myself, he backs up a second. He's already talked about his upbringing. Now he kind of backtracks a moment, and he goes back to his earlier upbringing. He go back in time, before by faith I took hold of this hope. He says, so then, back then, I thought to myself, mark that in your Bible. I thought to myself. This wasn't the Spirit of God. This wasn't the Word of God communicating this to me. I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is what I did. In Jerusalem, not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. As I was being punished by them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme, because if he could get them to, if he could provoke them to blaspheme, then they could be condemned to death. He says, and being furiously enraged at them, he was getting emotionally, he was, he was so emotionally involved in this, it had become an obsession in his life. He says, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities outside the boundaries of, of the land of Israel. And so this became an obsession in his life. His thought to himself that he had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus, that's a self-produced thought. And that shows us something, that we can have those self-produced thoughts. And these are things that God needs to break off of our life. If he's going to take us to the place in our life, he's always wanted to bring us. This is a thought that doesn't come from the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit brings truth into our life and pushes out the lies. He says, back then it made sense. Back then I thought to myself, and it made sense. It was a good career move for me as a a young upcoming member of the Pharisee party because Jesus was very unpopular among the party as a whole because he called out the Pharisees for elevating tradition over the Word of God. Now, I, I caution you on this because there were Pharisees that believed, but the majority of the Pharisaic party, Jesus was not popular among the, the majority. And so this was a good career move for him. I thought to myself, and I did this. This is what I did in Jerusalem. This is what his self-produced thought caused him to do. It caused him to be something of an anti-witness, an inversion of Acts 1.8. He says, I started off in Jerusalem, killing Christians, harming them, dogging them, pursuing them, trying to provoke them into blasphemy so I could have them put to death. I started that in Jerusalem. I'm trying to do things hostile to the name of Jesus in Jerusalem and then on into Judea and even into foreign countries. You see, he's almost an anti-witness, an inversion of what Jesus says in Acts 1.8. Verse 12, And while so engaged, as I was journeying to Damascus, he's now on his final phase. He's he's been an anti-witness in Jerusalem and in Judea. Now he's on his way to the furthest reaches of the earth, to stamp out the name of Jesus. With authority and commission of the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun in the Middle East at noon, shining all around me and those who are journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, everybody fell to the ground. New details here. I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
it is hard for you to kick against the goads. That's terminology that would be used to describe the a, uh, uh, the master of an animal trying to get an ox or, or a, a mule or something or a donkey, trying to get him into a pen, and he's using a prod to get that, that cow, especially get that cow moving in the direction it wants to move to get into the pen. And that cow doesn't like, it doesn't want to do what its master's telling him to do. It doesn't want to be put in the place the master wants to put him, doesn't want to be led to the place the master's leading. And so he kicks, but he injures himself by kicking against that sharp instrument. He actually hurts himself more than if he had just done what the master was leading him to do. And that's the language that Jesus is using here. Jesus is saying, I have been trying to nudge you into a place. I have a calling for your life. And you keep resisting it. It's hard to kick against the goats. So here you are laying on the ground, blind, because of the brightness of this light, struck blind. I need you to listen to me now. You've been running your mouth against me. Now I've made you blind so that maybe you can listen to me. Verse 15, and I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose, I have appeared to you. It's interesting the times that God knocks someone down, but he does it so he can raise them up. Sometimes in our Pentecostal services, we get so excited when somebody falls down. But I love how the prophet Ezekiel, when the Holy Spirit came upon him, he stood him up on his feet. I love how Jesus had to knock this guy down, but he raises him up. It's not about falling down. It's about standing up. What kind of a person are you when you stand up again? Stand on your feet. For this purpose I've appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen right here and now, but also to the things in which I will appear to you. I'm going to appear to you. I have subsequent things to give you, but they're on hold until you receive what I'm giving you now. That's an important detail to pay attention to. Verse 17, rescuing you from the Jewish people, the Israeli religious authorities, and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you. You're afraid of those Gentiles. You, you don't like them. They intimidate you. Don't be intimidated by them. I'm going to rescue you from them too, but I'm going to send you to them. He told them from the get-go he's going to send them to the Gentiles. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified or set apart by faith in me. So this is the third time we've heard this story told. We, we see the, the original narrative in Acts chapter 9. Paul's giving his own personal version of events in Acts chapter 22 and again here in Acts 26. But each time we get some new material and it's important to look at all three as a whole and not just skip over one of the others because we're familiar with the story. We get some fresh insights here. Jesus apparently appointed Paul to be a minister and a witness from the get-go. So when Ananias comes and gives him that personal word, we read about that in Acts 22, gives him that personal word, it confirmed what God had already told him through Jesus, had already told him on the road to Damascus. Now, that, that was confirmation to him, because how could Ananias have told, you know, known what Jesus had personally told Paul on the road to Damascus? Because none of the people that he was with understood what was said to him. Jesus says, I, I've got some future material to give you. You're going to be a witness, not just to what you saw here and experienced here in this moment. I have some more to share with you. You're going to be a witness of those things as well. And we see a lot of that gets unpacked in places like uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, throughout Paul's writings, he talks about revelations he's received. This is something that Jesus had promised him from the beginning would happen. Subsequent visionary encounters. He's going, to inc he's going to have many subsequent encounters with Jesus where Jesus imparts new information to him. And there's an important lesson. You know, sometimes Jesus gives us the Lord gives us a, a glimpse of something in our future. Here's, here's where I want to do in your life. Here's something I want to do in you. And we want to get there, but we don't realize to get there, I'm here, and I need to receive and obey what he's saying to me here. That's going to lead me to here, and, and I'm going to get new information. That's going to unlock new information that's going to get me to the next stage, and obedience there is going to lead to the next stage, and eventually it's going to lead to where God's always wanted to bring me. 
And sometimes people, we want to skip all this obedience stuff now, and we just want to grasp for that future thing, but we are unwilling to cross the ravines and the valleys and the ridges that lie between where we are now and where God showed us. Here's a lesson. If I won't receive what God's saying to me now, what God wants to reveal to me in the future, what he wants to do in me in the future gets withheld. Important lesson there. Jesus also apparently announced that he was sending Paul to the Gentiles from the very beginning with a fivefold purpose so that their spiritual eyes would be opened. Paul, you know what it's like to be blind and not be able to see? There's nations that are just as blind as you. And I want them to be able to see. So I'm going to send you to them and you can be a part of me opening their eyes. He sent them so that they might turn from darkness to light. You like living in darkness? You like living in where you can't see nothing? You're fumbling around? And Paul literally has experienced this. He's struck blind for three days. He says there's nations that are blind. I'm sending you to them. I want them to be able to see. So that they might be freed and transferred from the dominion of Satan to the dominion of God. That might not mean much to us, but to an Israeli first century Israeli, this makes this is very, very meaningful to them. Because in their worldview, if you read the Old Testament carefully, what you're going to see is God divides all of humanity into two realms, the realm of Satan and God's own realm. And he took Israel his, as his own, and he builds his realm around that nation. And out of that nation, he brings his Messiah, his anointed one, his son, and out of what his son does, he provides the way to redeem not just that one nation, Israel, but all the other nations. What Jesus did at the cross, it crushed the head of the serpent. He inflicted, it with his resurrection from the dead, he inflicted a mortal wound on Satan. Satan can lose his grip on all of the nations as a result of what Jesus did on the cross and by his resurrection. Yes, Jesus received a wound on the heel. Just like a snake will bite the heel and the venom will cause death, Jesus died on the cross. He received a wound literally on the heel when the nail spikes were driven in. But in that whole process, he crushed the head of the serpent. And so now God says, I'm ready now to bring my message to all of the nations. I'm, it's time to bring all the nations back into my realm. And I want you, Paul, to be a part of that. That's what he's saying here. Fulfilling, he, he's reminding Paul of the fulfillment. He's sh- saying the very first prophecy in the Bible, Genesis 3.15, is, is in the process of being fulfilled right now. He wants these nations to receive forgiveness of sin, something that has not been accessible to them. That they might become partakers of a heavenly inheritance. The same kind of inheritance that God had had offered up and and freely given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, it's time for all the nations of the world to receive an inheritance likewise. I have something for them. I want to give it to them. I've paid for it on the cross. I've risen from the dead. The serpent's head has been crushed. It's time to bring them all back into my family. And I want you, Paul, to be a part of that. Verse 19, so King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision but kept declaring both to those in Damascus first and also at Jerusalem, and then throughout the region of Judea, even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. And so after an initial start in Damascus, Paul actually, in his obedience, his initial obedience here, it corresponds to Jesus' pattern back from Acts 1.8. He testifies in Jerusalem. He testifies throughout the regions of Judea and even to the Gentiles, the furthest reaches of the earth. So with his life, he's already been living, Acts 1.8, empowered by the Spirit of God. The message his life carries is simple. People should repent and turn to God. Turn away from how I've been living to a whole new way of living. As a member, a fully enfranchised member of God's family. God's accepted me. Now I need to live from that acceptance. Not towards that acceptance, but from that acceptance. And the actions of repentant people should reflect that repentance. If my actions don't reflect repentance, that means I have not fully repented. Or I have not truly repented. And maybe I've gone through the motions. Genuine repentance produces actions that reflect 
that repentance. Verse 21, for this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. He brings us up now to current events. So, having obtained help from God, I stand this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place. I'm living what God said would happen. The Bible says that the Christ was to suffer, he says in verse 23, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. It talks about this in the book of Isaiah. It was foretold by the prophets that this would happen, and it's happening right now. I'm living it. So if Paul fast forwards here now from his past now to his present. He gets to the heart of the controversy, and the heart of the controversy is, I believe in the resurrection. The message his life carries, the message his life believes, is nothing more than what the scriptures already say was going to happen, that the Messiah was going to come in a way that maybe maybe we didn't want him to come that way. We wanted him to come and deliver us now from, from the right now threat and danger, and we didn't realize there was a greater threat and danger to our mortals, our immortal souls, and that is sin. He came to deal with something that, that we didn't realize how severe it was, how, pervas how pervasive it was in our life. But the Christ had to suffer. The Messiah had to suffer, had to rise from the dead. Only then can he be that conqueror that we've wanted him to be. He's going to come as a conqueror, but first he came to conquer sin. And what I believe in the life, the, the, the message that my life carries, it's nothing more than what Scripture already says. I'm on trial because I believe the word. What does scripture say? Messiah had to suffer. We talked about this many weeks ago. We looked at some, some of the, the prophecies, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, and that by means of his resurrection from the dead, the restoration of all things gets initiated. And that includes the redemption of all the other nations. In the Old Testament, you find lots of prophecy of God's judgment upon all the nations. But read them carefully because you're also going to see redemption of the nations in those same passages. Just like you see many, many prophecies about Jesus being, or the Messiah being this great ruler, this redemptive ruler who's going to, who's going to come and save and deliver Israel from, from the oppression of their enemies. That seems to be the mo most pervasive form of prophecy concerning Messiah in the Old Testament. But if you look carefully, you also see that he's going to suffer. You also see he's going to be rejected and condemned and die, but rise from the dead. In other words, those things are kind of hidden. By the same token, you see lots of prophecy of God's divine judgment on the Gentile nations. But look carefully, you're also going to see redemption of those nations. God says those other nations, they are just as important to me as you are. I went to the cross for them as well as for your own people. Verse 24, while Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus loses it. He says in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. And so the governor rejects the message here. But Paul answers and says, says it this way. He, I love how he responds to this. He says, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters. He turns his attention back to Agrippa. You know, the, the message of the resurrection, it's foolishness to the Greco-Roman mind. That's the stumbling block for the Greco-Roman, for the Gentile mind. Resurrection of the dead, it doesn't happen, it can't happen. It's foolishness to their minds. To the Israeli mind, the, uh, the objection wasn't so much the resurrection, or shouldn't have been the resurrection. For most Israelis, they do believe in the resurrection. Conceptually, that's not the problem. Conceptually, the problem is that Messiah was crucified. In their minds, that should have discredited him. And that was one of the purposes why they wanted him crucified, was to discredit him. But in the process, they actually fulfilled the prophecies in the scriptures. So he turns his attention now to the Israeli. You know, Herod, uh, Herod Agrippa is at least part, Israeli. So he's going to be approaching this more with an Israeli mind. So he bypasses Festus' rejection of his message. It's foolishness to him because of the resurrection. 
but he addresses it the, to the king. Because the king, he says, he says, the king knows about these matters. And I speak to him also with confidence, since I'm persuaded that none of these things escape his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. In other words, this is not some obscure stuff I'm talking about here. The governor rejects Paul's testimony. He says, Paul, you're out of your mind. You, you spent way too much time in your books, and you're, you've, you've lost it. He admits that Paul's highly educated and very intelligent, but he consigns his message to the realm of madness or religious fanaticism. But Paul's rebuttal is that these things, and he turns his attention to, to, to Agrippa here, he says, these things can be substantiated. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 8, Paul, in that passage, he spends an entire chapter correcting the Corinthians who had stopped believing in the existence of resurrection. Some of them had started to disbelieve in the resurrection, and so he spends an entire chapter correcting that because it's foundational to our walk with God. It's foundational to relationship. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 8, Paul lists the eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. And some 30 years later, most of these people are still alive. Many, if not most of them, are still around now. And Agrippa's from the area. He knows this. Festus, you're new to the area, okay? I, I'm going to give you a pass on this because maybe you're not familiar with these things, but the king is. Because this hasn't been done in a corner. In other words, these are events that have happened during his lifetime. And my beliefs are not reliant on some obscure and secretive events or rites. These, these are actually, my beliefs are actually founded on events for which compelling evidence exists. I saw Jesus. There are a lot of people who saw Jesus. Abundant evidence did in fact and does in fact exist. A person has to be willfully ignorant to persist in unbelief and the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. And so that's the heart of his testimony here. King Agrippa, he gets personal here. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? If, if, if you believe the prophets, this should be easy for you. Because I can walk you through the prophets where Jesus fulfilled all of these things. He says, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. If, if, you're, if you're so into this, you're such an expert in our, in our, in our, our faith and in our culture, of course you must believe the prophets. I have to believe that you believe the prophets. And Agrippa replied to Paul, In a short time you will persuade me to, be a come, to become a Christian. When he says this, people will have, have, have preached messages about this. That in a short time you'll persuade me, or, or some of your Bibles might say, I almost become a Christian as a result of what you're saying. It's almost like he's saying, you know, I'm almost ready to believe what you believe. I'm not quite ready to accept that yet. To our Gentile minds, it sounds like a good statement, like he's making progress here, but in reality, it's in the Greek language and in the culture of that time, what he says here is actually pretty cynical. And so Festus rejects him, and now actually Agrippa rejects the testimony. Not the outcome we were hoping for. We were thinking, man, the king's going to get saved here. In reality, he says, in a short time, you'll persuade me to become a Christian. Or it might be more of a question. He might be saying it more like this. Do you think that in such a short time, you can make me out to be a Christian? And remember that Christian, the, the term Christian means something different to them than it does to us. To our ears, it sounds like a good thing. Back then, it was a derogatory term. The term Christian was meant to insult Paul's beliefs. The king was saying, do you think that in such a short time you can, you can make me give up what, what I have, give up my, my heritage, and become like a Gentile to, to follow this belief that you've, you've followed? I, I'm not buying this. And so in reality, what he says to Paul is kind of a cynical rejection. Paul, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go that way. I'm I would be, it would be like me going and, and, be, and losing my Jewishness to become a Gentile. And it's, I point that out because that's one of the objections that, that Jewish people to this day sometimes have with regard to Jesus, is I have to give up my Jewishness. I stop being a Jew if I follow Jesus. And that's not the truth. But that's one of the arguments that gets posed, and that's what's happening here.
You think you, you can, in such a short time, convince me to abandon my Jewishness and become like a Gentile? I'd be, a, I'd be rejected by everybody. I, I, I have too much to lose to, to follow what you're following, to believe what you're believing. How does Paul respond to this in verse 29? Paul said, I wish to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. He says, I wish that everyone under the sound of my voice would get to experience what I am living and experiencing. I, I mean, these chains are inconvenient, so maybe not, let's forget about those, but to have what I have on the inside, I wish to God that all of you will have that. He continues to radiate the love of Jesus. He doesn't take it personal when his testimony gets rejected. We're catching another glimpse here of what it looks like to live life empowered by the Holy Spirit. This is what a Spirit-empowered witness looks like. It doesn't always look like multitudes getting saved. He doesn't take the rejection personally. In the face of abuse, slander, false charges, and insults, he maintains a consistent witness. How Paul handles himself here, it's evidence of the Holy Spirit's power in his life. You know, sometimes we're, we're after immediate results, and ultimately we don't know the, the full outcome. We won't know until we see the end of all things unfold before us. This side of eternity, we, 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 we're not going to get the answers maybe that we want to get. But I think when we step on the other side of eternity, we're going to see what the full impact was of this spirit-empowered testimony. Even though it looked fruitless at the time, there may have been a lot more going on here than meets the eye. And if nothing else, everyone here got a quality opportunity to turn and repent and receive God's forgiveness and be adopted into God's family. If they choose to remain outside God's family, that's their choice. They get to make that choice. But they got a great opportunity to receive that invitation to become a part of God's family. Verse 30, the king stood up and the governor and Bernice and all who were sitting with them. And when they'd gone aside, they leave the room. They, they go into a side chamber, presumably. And they began talking with one another, saying, This man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. Well, then what is he doing here? Cut him loose, right? And Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Now, sometimes I've read this, and maybe, maybe other people have read this and thought, You know what? Maybe, Paul, you made a mistake here. Maybe he made a, maybe Paul made a mistake. You know, if he if he hadn't appealed to Caesar, maybe this thing happens here and he gets cut loose. Maybe Agrippa would have given him, you know, the, the governor the courage to, to cut him loose, but I don't believe that that's the case. No, if if he'd gone back to Jerusalem, he would have never had this interview. Um, that 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 would not have happened. He said this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So once he appealed to Caesar, he set into motion things that not even the governor or King Agrippa could. Uh, could cancel out. This thing's going to have to play its yeah, run its course here. But I think this shows us something, that Paul is empowered by the Spirit not only to give a good witness, but also he's empowered by the Spirit to make good decisions. These people here are not entirely trustworthy. And so I believe the Holy Spirit revealed to Paul in that time, that now's the time to play that card, now's the time to make your appeal to Caesar, you, you're going to give a testimony in Rome. And so I don't look at this as a mistake. I look at this as Paul, empowered by the Spirit, gives his witness here, but he's also making good decisions. And I believe that we can trust Holy Spirit to empower our lives, not just to live a consistent witness of who Jesus is through unfair treatment, through good times and bad, but also empower us to make good decisions. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement that your word imparts to our lives. God, we just pray that you would help us, Lord, to walk in the empowerment of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would strengthen us on the inside to be the people that you want us to be. So when our moment comes, we wouldn't lose an opportunity to give a witness, whether the person or people respond the way we want them to respond or not. Lord, I pray that we would make a, a, an impact 
by your spirit, I pray that we would make an impact, that we would give a consistent witness. Lord, that people would get an opportunity, a quality opportunity to respond to your open invitation to join your family, receive your forgiveness, and be a fully enfranchised, fully equipped member of your family. Receive a heavenly inheritance. Lord, I pray that people would get that quality opportunity and that our life witness would nudge people in that direction. You know, one plants, one waters, but ultimately the Bible says it's you that caused the growth. And so, Lord, we just pray that our lives would be a part of that process in winning the nations back into your fold, into your family. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Well, God bless you. May he keep you. Causes goodness to rest on your life. We'll see you back here next time. Take care.